Hello, my name is Trish Bear, and welcome to Monster History, a show where we discover what people really believed about monsters. Today we're going to discuss brownies. No, sorry, not the kind you eat. Also, not the prank where you cut out E's from brown construction paper and tell people, look, I made you brownies. Get it? Brown E's? <laughs> no. Today we talk about the folklore creature called the brownie. Let's get started. Unlike the delicious dessert, the descriptions of brownies vary regionally, but they are usually described as ugly, and they receive their name from the fact that they are usually described as completely covered in brown hair. In the late 19th century, the Irish folklorist Thomas Kitely described the brownie as, quote, a personage of small stature, wrinkled visage covered with short, curly brown hair, and wearing a brown mantle and hood, end quote. They are usually envisioned as ugly, and their appearances are sometimes described as frightening or unsettling to members of the houses in which they reside. Now, you might think, that's not very nice to call them ugly. Well, here are a few descriptions that might make you agree. Brownies of the Scottish lowlands were said not to have noses, but instead had merely a single hole in the center of their face. And if that's not creepy enough, in Aberdeenshire, brownies are sometimes described as having no fingers or toes. Sometimes brownies are stated to appear like children, either naked or dressed in rags. They are often characterized as short and rotund, a description that may be related to mid-17th century Scottish descriptions of the devil. In the earliest traditions, brownies are either the same size as humans or sometimes larger, but in later accounts they are described as small, wizened, and shaggy. So imagine a hairy brown creature, either your size or larger, with a hole in its face, naked, fat, and possibly without fingers or toes, living in your house. Okay, now I can see why that might be frightening. But before you decide to kick them out of your house, let's get into some facts about what these creatures actually are. A brownie or bruni, as the Scots would say, also known as a gruach gahe, which is Scottish Gaelic, is a household spirit from British folklore that is said to come out at night while the owners of the house are asleep and perform various chores and farming tasks. Well, that's mighty nice of them. They only work at night performing necessary housework and farm tasks while the human residents of the home are asleep. Brownies originated as domestic tutelary spirits, very similar to the lairs of ancient Roman tradition, who were envisioned as the protective spirits of deceased ancestors. Brownies and lairs are both regarded as solitary and devoted to serving the members of the house. Both are said to be hairy and dressed in rags, and both are said to demand offerings of food or dairy. Like lairs, brownies were associated with the dead, and a brownie is sometimes described as the ghost of a deceased servant who once worked in the home. The called lad of Hilton, for instance, was reputed to be the ghost of a stable boy who was murdered by one of the lords of Hilton Castle in a fit of passion. Those who saw him described him as a naked boy. He was said to clean up anything that was untidy and make messes of things that were tidy. The presence of the brownie is believed to ensure household prosperity, and the human residents of the home are expected to leave offerings for the brownie, such as a bowl of cream or porridge or a small cake. These are usually left on the hearth. Many of you probably know what a hearth is, but I didn't, so just in case. Wikipedia comes to the rescue again and explains that the hearth is the place in a home where fire is or was traditionally kept for home heating and for cooking. Since most modern homes have heating and we don't need to gather around the stove for warmth, the hearth wouldn't need to be the center of the home. I'm guessing you could still put out a bowl of milk or cream or some cake on your stove for your brownie though. Brownies are almost always described as solitary creatures who work alone and avoid being seen. There is rarely said to be more than one brownie living in the same house. Some individual brownies are occasionally given names. 
brownies are virtually always male, but female brownies such as Meg Mullock or Harry Meg have occasionally been described as well. Can you imagine being called Harry Meg? Like, gee, thanks. I know I'm I'm Harry. I have hair all over. You don't need to you don't need to make that part of my name. Anyway, brownies have traditionally been regarded as distinct and different from fairies. In 1777, a vicar of Beatham wrote in his notes on local folklore, quote, A brownie is not a fairy, but a tawny-colored being which will do a great deal of work for a family if used well. The writer Walter Scott agreed, in which he states, quote, The brownie formed a class of beings distinct in habit and disposition from the freakish and mischievous elves, end quote. Since there don't seem to be many or any weaknesses of the brownie, let's talk about the strengths. Like the Fuca in Irish folklore, brownies are sometimes described as taking the forms of animals. As a rule, they are often capable of turning invisible, but they are supposed to rarely need this ability because they are already experts at sneaking and hiding. Okay, so not that many strengths, but I guess that's a good thing if you want your brownie to leave. Let's talk about how to ward one off. As it turns out, it really isn't that hard to get rid of a brownie. They are described as easily offended and will leave their homes forever if they feel they have been insulted or in any way taken advantage of. If the brownie feels he has been slighted, he will vanish forever, taking the prosperity of the house with him. Also, a brownie is said to take offense if a human observes him working, if a human criticizes him, or if a human laughs at him. Brownies are supposedly especially angered by anything they regard as contempt or condensation. Here's an interesting one. A brownie can be driven away if someone attempts to baptize him. Not sure what that's all about, but anyway. In some stories, even the manner in which their bowls of cream are given is enough to drive the brownie away. I just had a thought that you could give a brownie to a brownie. <laughs> Do you think they would find that offensive? Anyway, sometimes giving a brownie a name was enough to drive him away too. A recurring folkloric motive holds that if presented with clothing, a brownie will leave his family forever and never work for them again. Explanations differ regarding why brownies disappear when presented with clothes, but the most common explanation is that the brownie regards the gift of clothing as an insult. Remember the brownie named the cod lad of Hilton who was killed by his lord in a fit of passion, whatever that means? Well, he seemed to have wanted clothes and to have been grateful for the gift of them, yet still refused to stay after receiving them. After the servants presented him with a green mantle and hood, he supposedly joyfully sang before disappearing, Here's a cloak and here's a hood. The cowl of Hilton will do no more good. That was bad. Anyway, it is possible that the called lad may have simply thought of himself too grand for work, a motive attested to in other folktales, or that the gift of clothing may have been seen as a means of freeing him from a curse. Isn't that right, Dobby? These all seem like fairly easy ways to get rid of brownies, but be careful. You don't want to insult a brownie if you can help it. Brownies are characteristically mischievous and are often said to punish or pull pranks on lazy servants. The brownie will punish household servants who are lazy or slovenly by pinching them while they sleep, breaking or upsetting objects around them, or causing other mischief. Sometimes they are said to create noise at night or leave messes simply for their own amusement. What a bunch of punks. If you have insulted a brownie before leaving, sometimes the brownie is said to fly into a rage and wreck all his work. In extreme cases, brownies are even said to turn into malicious boggarts if angered or treated improperly. So if all this worries you, I'll tell you then how to find a brownie. The country's brownies are most often found are in Scotland and Northern England. They are said to inhabit homes and farms. Stories about brownies are generally more common in England and the lowlands of Scotland than in Celtic areas. Usually, the brownie associated with a house is said to live in a specific place, such as a particular nearby cave, stream, rock, or pond. 
If you live in a suburb though, they probably live in your house. Not to worry though, giving up some milk or a little bit of cake seems like a small price to pay to get some help with your chores. All I can imagine right now is a hairy creature vacuuming the living room. It's like cousin it came over so he could help you with your chores. Pretty nice actually. Now let's get into the history of brownies. In the late 19th century, brownies became popular in works of children's literature and continue to appear in works of modern fantasy today. Around 1650, a brownie at Overweight in Westmoreland was known as Tawny Boy, and a brownie from Hilton in County Durham was known as Called Lad. I guess these brownies didn't have a problem being given names after all. Maybe it depends on the type of brownie. I do love the people in these countries had names for them. In 1703, John Brand wrote in his description of Shetland that, quote, not above 40 or 50 years ago, every family had a brownie or evil spirit, so-called, which served them, to which they gave a sacrifice for his service, as when they turned their milk, they took a part thereof and sprinkled every corner of the house with it for brownie's use. Likewise, when they brewed, they had a stone, which they called a brownie stain, wherein there was a little hole in which they poured some wort for a sacrifice to brownie. They also had some stacks of corn, which they called brownie stacks, which, though they were not bound with straw ropes or in any way fenced as other stacks used to be, yet the greatest storm of wind was not able to blow away straw off them." End quote. Two Scottish witchcraft confessions, one by Thomas Shanks in 1649 and another by Margaret Combe in 1680, both describe meeting with a, quote, thick little man, end quote. The man in these descriptions may have been conceived as a brownie. The first mention in English of a brownie disappearing after being presented with clothes comes from Book 4, Chapter 10 of Reginald Scott's The Discovery of Witchcraft, published in 1584. In the 19th century, the pot hook used to hang pots over the fire was made with a crook in it, which was known as Herefordshire, as the brownie's seat or brownie's sway. If the hook did not have a crook on it, people would hang a horseshoe on it upside down so the brownie would have a place to sit. Aw, that's so nice. They gave a little seat for the brownie to sit on. Hopefully it didn't fall in the pot when they were cooking. Now, I said in early folklore brownies were the size of people, but later they were described as small as fairies. This is how a brownie was able to sit in the crook of the pot hook in the first place. Here's an interesting story. The brownie at the Portway Inn in Staunton on Wye reportedly had a habit of stealing the family keys, and the only way to retrieve them was for the whole family to sit around the hearth, or hearth, sorry, and to set a piece of cake on the hob, which was a flat metal shelf at the back of the fireplace. This was an offering to the brownie. Then the family would all sit with their eyes closed, absolutely silent, and the missing keys would be hurled at them from behind. So if you ever lose your keys, try this and see if it works. I can't guarantee your family won't think you're crazy though. Now that we've covered some of the brownie events in history, let's look at some famous tales told about brownies. The first tale we will tell is a story of a brownie who left the house he worked in. The stingy housewife fired all the servants because the brownie was doing all the work. So the brownie refused to return until all the servants had been rehired. Brownies are said to be motivated by, quote, personal friendships and fancies, close quote, and may sometimes be moved to perform extra work outside their normal duties. When the lady of the house went into labor, one brownie from Balquam went to fetch a midwife. In Peopleshire, two maids stole a bowl of milk and a bannock, which is a type of bread, that had been left out for the brownie. They sat down together to eat them, but the brownie sat between them invisibly, and whenever either of them tried to eat the bannock or drink the milk, the brownie would steal it from them. The two maids began arguing, each accusing the other of stealing her milk and bannock. Finally, the brownie laughed and cried, Ha ha ha! Brownie has die! Which is really old English for brownie has it. Anyway, the brownie at Cranshaw's in Berkwitshire is said to have moaned and thrashed the grain for years. 
Then someone commented that the grain had been poorly mown and stacked. So that night, the brownie carried all the grain to Raven Crag two miles away and hurled it off the cliff. A brownie who haunted Elmore Burn near Pitchleary in Perthshire was often heard splashing and paddling in the water. He was said to go up to nearby farm every night with wet feet, and if anything was untidy, he would put it in order. But if anything was tidy, he would hurl it around and make a mess. The people of the area feared him and did not go near the road leading up from the water at night. A man returning from the market one night heard him splashing in the water and called out to him, Puddlefoot. Puddlefoot exclaimed in horror, I've gotten a name! Tis Puddlefoot they call me! Then he vanished forever and was never heard of again. The Holman Clavel Inn in Somerset is also said to be inhabited by a mischievous hob or brownie named Charlie. The story was recorded by the folklorist R. L. Tung in 1964, immediately after he heard it from a woman who lived next door to the inn. Everyone in the locality knew about Charlie, and he was believed to sit on the beam of Hollywood over the fire, which was known as the Clavy. Once, when the woman was having dinner with the local farmer, the servants set the table at the inn with silver and linen. But as soon as they left the room and came back, Charlie had put all the table settings back where they had come from because he did not like the farmer that she was meeting with. <laughs> so I guess you have to get permission from your brownie to see which company you can have. Now let's look at some of the other regions with brownie-like creatures. Although the name brownie originated as a dialectal word used only in Northern England and Scotland, it has since become the standard term for all such creatures throughout Great Britain. Variants outside England and Scotland are the Welsh Bubak and the Manx Fenodiri. Regional variants in England and Scotland include Hobbs, Silkies, and this word. Even with Google Translate, I have no idea how to say that. The Menahunes of Hawaiian folklore have been compared to brownies as well, seeing that they are portrayed as a race of dwarf people who carry out work during nighttime. The 19th century folklorist Wirtz Sykes describes the Bubak as a good-natured goblin who performs chores for Welsh maids. He states that right before she goes to bed, the maid must sweep the kitchen and make a fire in the fireplace and set a churn filled with cream by the fire with a fresh bowl of cream next to it. The next morning, if she is in luck, she will find the bowl of cream had been drunk and the cream in the churn had been dashed. Especially in Yorkshire and Lancashire, brownies are known as hobs due to their association with the hearth. And those are just a few of the regions that have other brownie-like creatures. So, what's the verdict? Do you believe in brownies? Or do you believe such creatures couldn't possibly exist? Either way, there were a lot of people and historians who claimed they existed, and some say they may still exist. And you know what they say, history always repeats itself. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, please click the hitchhiker button and subscribe. Also, if you would like to check out my comic that showcases these monsters, head on over to webtoons.com and look for my comic titled, Welcome to Bakersfield. I also left the link in the information section. A big thank you to Wikipedia for the information for this video. Thank you again for watching, and I hope to see you next time as we take another close look at a monster. Brownies of the mm, Brownies of the Scottish Lowlands were said to mm, Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Brownies and Brownies and Brownies oh. The writer Walter Scott agreed in his minist <laughs> What the crap is this word? Minstrel Minstrel You know what? I'm not even putting that in there. The writer <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> A recurring folkloric motif. The first tale we tell is the story of a brownie. Okay, sorry, I'm not doing that. <laughs>